Hey number ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the method on speaking. Oftentimes we see medieval soldiers. We see them all the time in video games, in movies. And the idea of a medieval soldier's kit and how much of an encumbrance would be is really a question that has been permeating my thoughts for, I don't know, two decades. Now I so happen to have a full medieval soldier's kit right behind me and this is a very historically accurate and coherent set. So I think that this is a great opportunity to start answering this question. How much encumbrance would a full medieval soldier's kit have? How heavy was a medieval soldier? How much would it slow you down? And of course we're not only going to focus on combat because usually people just think about combat but it's interesting to think that combat is really not the only thing that a soldier does. In fact it's probably one of the least things a soldier happens to do. His daily routine most of the time is not going to involve combat but it's going to involve a lot of other things. How tough would it be to wear a real historically accurate medieval set? Well, let's have a look at the set and I'll answer that question for you. Of course, the Middle Ages are a very long period of time. We're talking about over a thousand years, depending on how you count it. So uh, in this case, we need to choose a specific century and I decided to go for a 15th century soldier. I've got quite a lot of options in terms of my offense. So I've got three different maces and an arming sword, so a one-handed sword. And as far as my soft kit is concerned, I've got the typical medieval hose. I've got leather shoes and my arming doublet, which is a reinforced garment that you use to to attach elements of armor. In fact, it's got all the points, which are these linen threads with brass caps that are used, in fact, to attach elements of armor, such as your full plate leg harness, full plate arms, shoulder plates. In terms of my helmet is concerned, I picked a very typical kettle hat. Uh, usually when people think of a kettle hat, they usually think of the, the one that actually looks like an iron hat. The one I'm having here is a late 15th century, typical Italian style, and from this kind of helmet, you will have the, the further development in the future of the salad, which is very similar if you think about it, particularly if you look at it from the back. Now, as far as torso protection, I've got my male shirt, regular riveted steel rings, short sleeved, regular length of the time. It also goes all the way down protecting my groin. I've got a male standard, which is the protection or the collar, protection for my throat. And then on top of that, I've got my brigandine, which People who are familiar with this channel already know. I've got dedicated videos, so I won't go too much into the details of this, but it's a very well-made brigandine made of many different hardened steel plates, fully tinned and riveted to a hand-spun silk velvet outside garment through 2,000 brass rivets. So what kind of medieval soldier do we have here? Well, this is a, it's a well-equipped soldier. Now, given, I'm sure that the first thing you're noticing, I've got no protection for my arms and no protection for my legs. So is this like a light kit? Well, I wouldn't really call it a light kit because I've got two layers of protection on my torso. I would rather call it a more of a medium kind of soldier's kit, if you will. Some medieval soldiers did choose to go all the way to full plate protection for their limbs, but not all did. And we see this back up with evidence iconography shows that some soldiers just had a spear a shield a helmet and that was that which is wearing then their army doublets and their hose and then regular shoes and it seems like that the next element of protection that you do buy after you've got a helmet and you've got your weapon and your shield is your torso protection and if you can't afford it you just leave your your limbs unprotected and perhaps some people even chose to do so so this set is coherent I've got good protection for my torso perhaps at the moment as I'm a soldier who yeah, has gone through a few battles, has earned some money, has survived, he could buy a good brigandine. He has definitely got a thing for maces, I mean, that's quite clear. And let's try and put all of this on and let's see how much it slows me down as I go on with my day as a medieval soldier. Let's go for it.
So am I armed well enough to perform as a functioning soldier on a medieval battlefield? And the answer is that my, as we said, my armoring up is fine, but my weapons um, I'm lacking because I've got quite a good selection of maces. I've got a very good sword. I do need a proper scabbard to be made for that sword, which I still don't have. Um, but most importantly, what I need is a pole weapon. I need a pole arm to properly function as a medieval soldier. And that's something that I'm still lacking. And eventually I will get one, uh, possibly couple maybe, uh, prepared properly for me so I can take them to a perhaps even a medieval town or a medieval castle we've got quite plenty here in Sicily and in Italy you know never mind it's like countless and uh, I could you know make some really good footage so look forward to that but what about shields shouldn't I be using shields and if the answer is yes then what sort of shields should I be carrying and the answer to that can actually depend because it really depends what specific century and what specific date I'm trying to reenact. And as a content creator on this platform, yes, I will get quite a few shields. I will get a Rodella, which is the circular shield used in the medieval reality. I will get obviously a few heater shields. I'm hoping to get a Pavese, uh, which is like the massive shield you normally use as a stationary shield to protect crossbowmen because I would love to fully reenact also a uh, Genoese crossbow of the late middle ages that would be fantastic uh, so yeah i will be looking into a whole range of shields to use and perhaps compare but the moment i specifically decide to reenact a soldier with a specific kit in mind like for example this is clearly mid to late 15th century so as we pass 1450 1460 then if the impression i'm recreating or you are recreating is an italian impression then shields such as heater shields start to become not very used very much in Italy but if you are recreating an impression of say a 1450s uh, man at arms in France or Germany no problem heater shields were still used if we go to Luxembourg then I can easily find a piece of evidence such as this one a piece of iconography this is dated 1453 and still heater shields are used so heater shields were used also into the mid and sometimes even late 15th century in Europe but depending on what specific country you are reenacting then you might it might be appropriate or not or you might need to select a different kind of shield but for me as a content creator because I like discussing all of these things then I definitely will pick up uh, perhaps shields that wouldn't be specific for the Italian impression but it won't matter because of course I'll give you caveats to, to that but at the moment what I'm wearing it can be used really for many different impressions I mean brigandines were used in quite a few countries in Europe now given some countries do present a lot less evidence for brigandines than others and when we look at for example the brigandine shoulders the spolders then those as well they're even less common and it's more common to see instead full plate shoulder plates now they do exist uh, but, they, but then again depending on what specific country you're trying to reenact and what impression you're trying to build then that might dictate uh, the sort of repertoire that you've got available to choose from and that's the same for helmets and whatnot now that's not to say that if you are reenacting a noble knight so mounted nobility so you're a wealthy man you're rich and perhaps you know you have seen people in let's say that you're reenacting an italian knight but you have seen people are using specific kinds of helmets or specific kinds of of weapons and armor or armor configurations that you like nobody stops you from getting that stuff whether it be for personal collection or whether it be for actually carrying on the battlefield there will be exceptions now from a reenactment point of view we shouldn't really reenact exceptions too much because if you do then they become the norm and there will be a big difference in in the way the middle ages are represented on a reenactment level and the way the middle ages were uh, in reality and so you will have a very different look because everybody's looking is wearing the same kind of very obscure helmet that perhaps only I don't know a, a handful of people used in the medieval period but everybody likes it now and so it has become a ubiquitous helmet so that can happen generally speaking I want to say I can tell that there is a relative big difference between wearing a male shirt alone with the entirety of the rest of the kit and wearing a brigandine on top of that there is a difference but in terms of how I can move, as you could see, you know, my mobility is almost the same. Now, given you might have noticed that, that there is some 
range of motion that I kind of lose or perhaps becomes a bit awkward when it comes to raising my arms all the way up here but that's because of my arm in doublet. It's not because of my brigandine and therefore it's not because of my male. It's not the armor part that is really doing that, restricting me, but it's the soft kit, although this might sound counterintuitive. Even wearing all of my kit together, including the brigandine on top of the male shirt, because of the fact that my brigandine is well-shaped and it tapers at the waist, therefore distributing the weight very well on my body and basically almost non-existing weight on my shoulders because it's all in the center of my body and my waist the natural waist then it doesn't really it does add to the overall weight i'm wearing but still this kind of set i wouldn't consider it heavy at all i can easily wear all of this all day and it's actually easier for me to wear than a lorica segmentata of the roman imperial period and when i say that please keep in mind for those of you who don't know that i do have a video where i show myself testing out the lorica segmentata of the romans to the point of wearing it every day all day for 14 days in a row so i'm not what i'm talking about when i come when i talk about comfort and discomfort of the lorica segmentata and when i compare it to this this is a piece of cake now that's interesting because what I'm wearing is a double layer protection whereas a segmentata is a single layer protection. But the thing is that it's a matter of shape. You wouldn't believe how much a properly shaped armor takes away much of the encumbrance from you. It is unbelievable. Now given with a Lorica segmentata you also have shoulder protection that are in, you know, integrated into the set. Uh, with this I need to add it. So for example I've got these. The reason why I'm not wearing them is because they are slightly anachronistic and they're generally speaking German in, in their shape. Th that's what I have. I usually use them for spam. Uh, but my Italian set is also arriving. It was sent to me, the rest of my arm harness and shoulder plates. And so I might actually do some tests. But So I am a little lighter compared to a Roman when it comes to my shoulders. But even if I added the shoulders, because of the fact that they are pointed and they can be pointed either to male or directly to my arm in doublet, it's really up to you. There are lots of, you can even point them to the leather straps, really. This was done as well. Um, so the reason, because of the fact that they are pointed, because of the system in which they are suspended suspension really helps and the, the lorica segmentata as a design really focuses on the fact that yeah it's uncomfortable because most of the shoulder weight because the shoulder plates will be on your shoulders i mean the body of a lorica segmentata when it's properly shaped it's okay you don't really feel it that much then you put on your king Gulum militaris nice and tight the uh, military belt and then that's okay but the shoulders will be on your shoulders and given you can wear a toracomacus or a, a subarmalis underneath which is a padded garment that most likely they did wear because it is mentioned in, in, in latin literature although we call, of course we don't have surviving examples because be, it being organic material it deteriorated from the classical period regardless of that the lorica segmentata very much of it is on your shoulders but this even if you add other pieces it's all going to be suspended. So this is one of the areas in which we see a drastic technological development and improvement in the medieval period, of course, late medieval period in this case, as, as opposed to the uh, first century. Yes, all armor is made of metal, although it's not exactly the same kind of metal, perhaps I'll make a dedicated video to that, but the way the armor is worn really makes a significant difference. So how encumbered am I as a medieval soldier? Not that much. I can do a lot of things. Now, given it's not as, as easy to do, uh, things are not as easy to do and tasks and, and chores are not as easy to perform and guard to duty and whatnot as they would be if I wasn't wearing armor. But of course, wearing armor, it, it, that's just how it is. It's, it's a compromise. I mean, you're getting a lot of protection, which you do need and you do want as a soldier. And I have to say that the compromise is more than acceptable. So if you have a late medieval soldier in your book, in your D&D session or just a movie and you want to know how encumbered would regular medieval soldier be in his kit, well, I want to say not very much. You can really do a lot of things. You would be someone who does it on a regular basis, at least on campaign, when called on campaigns. And if you're a professional man at arms, you would do it all the time. So I would imagine it would be even easier for them than it would be for me. Now, perhaps we will make the same sort of video before a full medieval knight kit, which I will produce soon on the channel as soon as the uh, my medieval full plate armor arrives. But for today, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you're not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the meta. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.